I am a human being and I killed human beings. I kept the, uh, the mummified head and skull of one of the victims. That huge break. Police say they now have the killer in custody. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. These are the stories of the killers and the people who hunt them. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. On today's show, we are talking serial murder in South Africa, from the earliest serial cases to the current trends, and learn how cops are trained to catch the killers who stalk our streets. My name is Paul Vivian Lewell, and I'm a journalist curious to reveal the truth behind serial crime in South Africa. Joining me to reveal these incredible stories every week, Jared Labaskachny is the former cop who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Gerard, in a career, how many people in the world have as much experience as you? Because when I, when I do this introduction every week and I think 300 serial murder and rape cases, surely you are in a very, very small club. Uh, yeah, I was fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know was the correct way to describe it. But, unfortunately, um, <laughs> yes. But yeah, if I, if I, I think probably the only people that would have, would have had something comparable would have been to, to my unit. Cause I mean, obviously there's, there's not just me in the unit would have been the old FBI profilers, the ones who, the big names, the wrestlers, the Hazelwoods who were there for a long period of time and worked on cases. Um, cause if I speak to a lot of my, colleagues or profilers overseas, you know, a lot of them, if they're in their career, they might have worked on one serial case, murder mm. series. Um, two or three is, is getting quite good for a state profiler. Um, the FBI, because they worked the whole country, might have been exposed to a lot more. So I think there's definitely up there, if not more than or comparable to the, the, the old school. I mean, the FBI's profilers really have all changed. There's, there's a totally new guard of guys who probably only have four or five ex years experience. So I always say that working in South Africa in this type of work, in a year, you've worked a other person's career lifetime of this kind. It's of that life. idea of the the intern doctor that comes to work at a baraguana. Absolutely. For example. Yeah. Um, I think it's important because I, I want our audience to understand that in, in in these conversations, we are getting an insight from 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 an individual in yourself who who has a very very unique. Mm -hmm and um, uh, insight into into the crimes mm. and into the to the the world that mm. we're talking about and, and i want to encourage the audience at home if there are particular topics that you'd like us to cover in the show if there are any particular questions that you have for jared this really is a unique opportunity to to pick the brain of of one of the planet's leading experts in this field Today, we're talking about serial murder in general. We really want to talk about the kind of curve of serial murder over the last 25 years. Let's start off by talking about what were our earliest serials doing? Mm. Yeah, so look, I mean, uh, there's probably been serials that we've never even realized we had in history. And of course, criminal records from the past are not what they are today. But, you know, some of the earlier ones would be sort of, I think we have records for would be, I think, in the 30s. I definitely, for example, in my unit used to have a, a, a court trial record from uh, 1953, Elifazi Msormi in KZN. And interestingly enough, he was doing pretty much what they do nowadays. You know, he would walk up to the various crawls and offer ladies employment and they would go with them and then he would rape and murder them. So I think the basics perhaps we've seen over the years, people have deviated quite markedly like Stuart Wilkin from Port Elizabeth, mm. but the basics of how they're operating and, and the way they approach it is, is kind of very similar to what it was a, a very long time ago. Is there a case that, that got you an early case that you came across that got you really interested in this field? Um, I think some two of the earlier ones, which I then later had the opportunity to, do, to interview the offenders. I mean, Stuart Wilkin is definitely a guy who he had just such a weird broad range of victims, what he did with the victims. It involved cannibalism, necrophilia. I mean, he was just quite a fascinating guy because it's such a diverse level of activity of what, what he did. He killed sort of seven people, including his own daughter, two street kids, two adult sex workers. Um, 
um, just because it's just such a wide range of stuff that he did. So that was quite fascinating and to interview him. And, and same with the Norwood serial murderer, uh, Kuba Skeldenais from the late 89, 1991 mm -hmm. in Norwood. He was the policeman uh, raping and killing people. And I uh, had the opportunity to interview him for quite, for quite a long time. I think they were just... You know him because he's a policeman, and Stuart Wilkins because it was so bizarre. Um, but again, you know the the, the the quarry guy was interesting for for for, for sort of different reasons. So mm -hmm. they all have their interesting aspects about them, um, but it might be for completely different. Uh, I, I mean, if we look at the the kind of internationally the story of serial killers and what have you, probably one of the earliest populous serial killers is Jack the Ripper in London. Mm. Uh, do we consider that there have always been these types of predators in our midst? Yeah, look, I, I think you have to take the realities of the apartheid system. Did the police care? Black female found dead. Were they going to do anything about it? Did we have, we don't have, we didn't have, I mean, DNA as a forensic tool was only really here in the sort of the early mid 90s mm -hmm. and it was not the same level of quality dna that we're using now you know there it was a little bit better than blood grouping you know yeah. now it's it's you know within one in a billion it's just, it is this type of person those are the stats you're talking about so you know the the, the forensic techniques for linking cases differed communication across areas was different now compared to 60 years ago the media was not what it was nowadays were they reporting on these things where people could sometimes maybe realize that there's multiple murders as i said if it was black females that didn't anybody care in the old apartheid system mm -hmm. and were bodies found outside townships dealt with as political violence what, what is interesting though is that we um before 1994 probably 50 percent of the serial murders we arrested were white sure. 50 percent being black yeah. since 1994 I think in my time in SAPS, out of all the uh, 110 cases I worked on, only one or two were white. So it literally, after 94, ironically, our white serial murderers almost disappeared off the radar. Yeah, and was it, you know, um, did you know, did the apartheid system empower people? Talking about modus operandi, what is then the current demo of, a, of your typical serial killer? We've talked about it. Um, let's go into a bit more detail. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the basic typical modus operandi we would see would be approaching someone and offering them a job. Whether you're a serial rapist, serial murderer, that is pretty much the stock standard way that the suspect will, will try and get his victims. Okay. Very rarely will it be a guy who just, you know, goes into someone's house and, and kills them. You know, that's the know what serial murderer did that. Um, uh, Kuba Sheldonais, but the typical thing is you approach someone and offer them a job. Interesting enough, though, amongst your white serial murderers, you'll usually pick up prostitutes. Okay. And they tend to usually be black prostitutes. Yeah. So, ironically, if we find a string of black female prostitutes murdered, we're probably looking for a white guy. Okay. But again, it would be perhaps more unusual for a white guy to go into downtown Joburg and just walk around offering people work. It might stand out too much. Yeah. So it's easier to pick up a sex worker who will get into your car and go with you to a deserted place. Absolutely. So again, it's, it's, it's the politics, it's the economics of, of crime that causes people to commit their crimes in, in, in different yeah. ways. Uh, so it's, it's that preying on the most vulnerable communities mm -hmm. where you have a, a much better chance that there is not going to be a community of people that that care about this person or it's going to be well, somebody know that's missing. easily manipulated yeah. and what have you. Because, you know, we, we, as I said, we often, we, in many cases, we only identify 50% of our yeah. victims. And is it because it's someone from a different country who's here legally or illegally? Is it from someone who's from Toyondo who just might not communicate with their family for six months anyway? Yeah. And how would they know where she was lost staying in an informal settlement? You lose track of people. Yeah. Are, are, are we typically talking talking South Africans in, in your um, serial killer history how many non-South Africans I don't think we ever sat down and did proper stats but okay. I would say of the ones who identify probably so, oh, I had to put a rough figure to it 75% would be South Africans okay. of the identified ladies and then yeah. you know the other ones would be the quarry case of example and the killers the, themselves so any, have we had foreign killers in the country no actually I can't think of any foreign okay. serial murder they're all locals how typical is it in a serial case that the victims will be known to the killer? Mm. We, we, we did quite a nice big study um, a couple of years ago in collaboration with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, um, where they looked at, oh, I think it was about 30 or so of our convicted series to start to analyze the, the stats about the cases, the victimology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's where we got some really, really nice rich data because obviously a lot of it had been our own experiences, which can be accurate, but also might not be 100% accurate. So we really came up with some nice studies that was published on our South African serials that were then in, in uh, the Journal of Investigative Psychology and Offender Profiling. So that's available to people out there. Um, and we tend to find that a lot of our, our victims are, are not 
not identified. Um, about 18% actually, sorry, are never identified. The relationship, about 73% of the victims have no relationship to the suspect. In other words, they're strangers. About 15% are acquaintances. They kind of know the person, but they're not intimately involved. About 7% were family members. And about two and a half percent were actually in a relationship with the suspect that that that, that, okay. that then killed them. Yeah. So again, a pretty mixed bag. A mixed bag, and even with our, our races, I mean, uh, victims they tend to obviously reflect the dynamics of the country. So about seventy six percent are black, seven point seven percent white, eleven percent coloured, two point three were Indian, and 07 percent were Asian, which of course differs from the United States. So that's why again we have to be careful about taking. American profiling and American research and just apply it directly to South Africa because our circumstances are not are not the same. So you can't say, well, he's probably a white guy. Well, no, he's probably not because it's South Africa. In China, it's probably not going to be a white guy either. It's going to probably be a Chinese guy. Yeah. So you have to sort of take that. You can't just apply overseas knowledge and, and, and here. Um, you know, most of the victims, about 40% were unemployed, again, which fits in with the modus operandi, offering someone a job mm. um, because of a high unemployment. 22% of victims did have some kind of labor job. 15% were students and very few, about 4.5% were sex workers, um, which okay. is quite contrary to the United States, where about 22% of their victims in okay. serial murder cases are sex workers. Because again, yeah. if I tell my colleagues overseas, but the guy just walks up to some random lady, offers her a job, and she goes with him, their jaw hits the table and says, why would she go with him? So for them, that would never work in the exactly. Netherlands and the United States. So what do they do? They maybe pick up sex workers yeah. or they surprise people in their homes yeah. uh, and, and do what they did, like the, the, the BTK killer, yeah. the buy and torture kill killer in, in the States in Wisconsin. Mm. Um, so that, again, is how your circumstances, cultural behavior alters how you're going to be able to act out your your, your crime. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the, the arc, the journey of a killing. I'm a killer. I've just killed a victim. I've gotten that release. Now the cycle begins again. Yeah. So we often talk about that as the cooling off period. So you, if you if you read FBI literature, they'll speak of this, you know, in between the murders, they're back to their normal life, doing whatever they do to survive and get by with their family, friends, work and employment, etc. And then that urge starts to creep up again. That desire, maybe because of frustrations they're experiencing in their life in general, in their relationships maybe, in their romantic relationships, their work environment, and that urge builds up again and they decide, I want to go out and do this again. Uh, and of course, then they start to go out, they're ready. So on that day that they do this, they usually would have known, I'm good. this is what I'm setting out to do today. Okay. Then they go obviously to the comfort zone, the area, geographical area of operation that they feel safe and comfortable in, and of course, start to approach a victim that fits their needs. Mm. So we do find, because that underlying fantasy that we've spoken about before there is an ideal victim like we all have i'd love to date you know the charlize teron type or you know kanye Mbao type mm. in reality are we going to end up doing that no so we might find someone that to a greater or less degree matches those characteristics and features and personality mm. and that's the same when that criminal goes out there on the day he can't be too picky because if he wants to commit that murder he might have his ideal type but he has to go for what he can get so that's why yes you will find perhaps visually certain similarities across the victims and of course depending what they want to do if he wants to rape the woman and he's heterosexual he's, he's going to choose obviously female victims as opposed to men so already there's that victimology in terms of gender at least in south africa that killer will typically then decide today I'm, i need to go and itch the scratch um i'm going to go i'm going to find someone i'm going to kill them well you mentioned like a btk for a mm. btk the the stalking mm. period was was an extended and quite an yeah. intensive process and a big part of yeah. of his modus operandi so here our, our people don't stalk in the sense of like let's say btk he might find and follow a victim that he sees at a shop and sees where she stays yes. and decide that's my house that's what i mean yeah, yeah we don't really get that here okay. he will literally be i'm in my area where i want to pick up a victim and i look around and i'm going to approach the ones because there's a massive pedestrian you know bunch of people walking around let's for example say in, in the center of johannesburg and that's the one i want to approach and he'll approach her and she might say no go to hell uh, but eventually he's going to find someone who says yeah i do need a job Really, it pays yeah. 200 rand a day or an hour or whatever, please. And he might go with her right then and there, or he might say, okay, well, meet me here tomorrow with your ID book and your CV. And that sounds even more believable. Mm. And then they go, ride in a taxi, at some point get off, alight the taxi and take a shortcut through a field, which is very common for people who are on foot to take shortcuts. And in the area where he's predetermined, because he knows it's safe, he's going to get that lady there and then rape and murder them and leave them there. Yeah. Because they don't have vehicles, they can't transport the bodies. Because they don't have vehicles, they also can't, you know, move around as much. Yeah. And, you know, if you do have a vehicle, you're more likely, like the um, 
uh, the serial rapist who was targeting young young uh, children a, f- a couple of years ago, he had a car. So he was in Northwest, Krugersdorp, Joburg, here, there, and everywhere because he had a vehicle that allow him to do that. But most don't. And that, again, alters how you're going you're gonna to have to lure that victim with you. How do you do that? Con story. Yeah. And it also does speak to the society that you live in. I mean, in America, you can... It, it, there's going to be more security systems. There are going to be more cameras. Mm. You've got to have the confidence to know that you're going to get away with it. So, yeah. so you've got more maybe to navigate. Whereas in our environment, commuting is busy and people come and go, and it's pretty easy it's to on foot and it's public exactly. transport and yeah. almost like an anonymous society, you yeah. know, uh, to some degree in terms of people. Yeah, specifically if you're talking to victims who live in an informal settlement, yeah. you know, it is so. So, life. would you say that uh, you know as South Africa's economic circumstances improve, typically we would, if, if that were to happen, we would see serial crime diminish. I don't know if it would diminish, it would change, because you change. still have those okay. guys popping up there who have these urges. Yes, okay. But perhaps how they went about it would have to change. Yes, yeah. okay. And now we've even seen it where people start to use social media as a way of luring and obtaining victims, Absolutely. sourcing victims, offering them a job. So again, that's technology now being adapted into a serial murderous okay. behavior. So we've spoken about the MO for the, the typical MO today, the typical victim type, what to look out for in suspects. Last week, we talked about profiling and how you build a profile. In segment two, we're going to talk about how policing serials has evolved and how the police Mm. are practically trained in South Africa to catch serial killers. So stick around for that. Um, We are stick around for that. Tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search Profiler Africa on YouTube and please subscribe to our page. We're also available on iTunes and you can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook. Simply search for Profiler Africa. We'll be back. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every day. On Profiler, we bring you the stories of the serial criminals and the people who hunt them. I am Paul Llewellyn. I am a journalist with a fascination for serial criminals. My partner in crime is Jared Labaskachny, former head of SAP's investigative psychology section and the man responsible for catching some of SA's most prolific serial killers. Uh, Gerard, training. Mm. How has policing evolved when it comes to serials? Dramatically, thankfully so. Um, obviously, 1994, when we kind of first actually got to grasp with the grips to the concept of serials and it became a thing, if you can, if you can put it that way, in South Africa, we didn't really know what we were doing. And that's why they did bring out Robert Ressler, a very well-known FBI profiler who's many books out there, who came out to assist and give us that knowledge that we don't have to bang our heads and make the silly mistakes that everybody else has made when they first start to deal with serials. And he also then came out and gave us some training two saps and that became eventually the course that still exists to today presented by my old unit and and me when i was still there but we've adapted it dramatically to make it a south african course so in the beginning phases even when i joined in 2001 the course content had lots of american examples of serial murderers and i'm like we've had a heck of a lot and you know what what's the relevance Mm of discussing lots of serial murders from America when, you know, we've had enough to fill a couple of volumes of, of training manuals. Yeah, so, and, the, and, the, and the modus operandi of a BTK like is not typical yeah. to the modus operandi of a South African. And, and the resources we have. Before we get into the training, let's talk about the definition of serial mm. murder. Yeah. What are we talking about? What are we, tra- we're training for to, to do what? What is serial yeah. murder? How do we so, define it? You know, if you, if, you, if you start to look into it and read about it, you'll get lots of different definitions. And that was kind of part of the problem. You know, certain definitions were influenced by the law. So in America, there was one, I think, a federal definition that said it must be two murders, but one must have been committed in the United States. Because that would allow the laws to certain the FBI to get involved, et cetera, et cetera. So you even find that the legal, r- legal requirements altered the definition. Researchers sometimes even went up to saying that you had to have 10 victims before you can call it a serial, you know, over time. Other ones said you have to have a sexual murder. In other words, there's been an element of rape. Mm. Um, but then we have people who just shoot people like the Beltway snipers in the United States or even the saloon killer here. They just 
killed randomly people with a, with a gun. Now, would they not qualify? So the problem became people would take a common feature and make it a criteria for the definition. So in 2005, the FBI held a symposium in, in, in San Antonio, Texas, and they invited people from throughout the world to come and sit and let's discuss these issues and come to some kind of consensus. And I was very fortunate enough that mm. SAP sent me to that to that meeting. It was quite a historical meeting. That, and those findings have been published that you can get online for free, the, the findings of that symposium. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll post a link on our, on our Facebook page. So and go it and looked check at it you know, things like motives and definitions and this and mental. And so it was quite a an interesting outcome and, and really some really great names participated in, in, in the field in that particular meeting. But by ultimately what they said, and they reduced the definition to quite quite simplistic and saying that it's the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender in separate events. Okay. So you have to have at least two murders that occurred on at least two different occasions. Okay. Thereafter, you can have two bodies at the same time, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, it's in separate events. And that's, again, the cooling off period we might have touched on earlier. So that actually simplifies it to a lot because that means, technically speaking, if you're a hitman that's paid to go and kill a bunch of people, you're a serial killer, but yeah. of the hitman type. Yes. You know, and then you get the good old-fashioned Moses Atole, which is a sexually motivated one, which is the majority of what we get faced with here. Mm-hmm. But then you get those. It even includes those, for example, who off their husbands for the insurance policies would be the black widow type. So the FBI definition actually was very simplistic with lots of the various sub types based on the motive and that's the de- definition in 2005 was kind of consistent with what we said in south africa the two separate murders mm. um we just said for example it's usually strangers etc but the simplistic one is two separate murders by the same individual you can start to refer to the person as a serial murderer his motive might be different to the like i said the 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 hitman versus yeah. the moses Atola type versus the black widow killing for insurance policies so how do we catch these people? How do we train the cops yeah. to catch these people? And, and without a doubt, we've shown it in South Africa that if you have trained people and you put together a task team, you will probably have a success in catching. They'll have the best chance. Um, and that's why SAPS has had a pretty good record. But it, as I said, it starts with how do we identify these? So that, again, comes back to forensics. So we have DNA that's being processed that helps us link cases that we might not never have known are the same for various reasons. is essential and very important nowadays in helping us realize we have serials active. What is the... How long does it take to get a DNA profile examined? Or how does it take to get a a DNA, a piece of evidence uh, uh, examined? Well, once it's submitted to the forensic laboratory, um, look, you can get a result in 24 hours. Okay. Uh, you know, if it's high profile enough. Okay. So it's not like the, I mean, I, I, I asked this just because I was watching a, a program in America and they were saying that, oh, it was, a, it was a murder case. And he was saying, oh, we'll get the DNA back in six to 12 months. Yeah. So look, high, and I said, no, with a proviso high profile enough. And unfortunately, serials don't always fall into that category of high profile enough. Okay. So you can get it back within 24 hours. Um, we usually would get the DNA prioritized in serial cases that we can hopefully get a result within okay. a week or two. The standard waiting period, depending on how busy they are, can be anything from six weeks to three or four months. Okay. So you might complain, oh my God, but that's so long, but my colleagues in the States, in the local law enforcement, are waiting six months for their DNA. For sure. And they're only allowed to, for example, send in maybe three samples per case. Okay. We've had samples where we've cordoned off a whole section of an informal settlement and swabbed everybody and sent into the forensic science laboratory 500 swabs of people who live in the area to try and identify our suspect. And my colleagues in the States look at me and go, my God, how did you get that mm. right? Look, forensics wasn't happy with us, as you can yeah, imagine, goodness, but sure. they didn't stop us. Yes. And of course, we, in many of those cases, we do identify the suspect through that process if we we're good enough to narrow down the geographic area. So we, we have the advantage that we're not limited by how much DNA we can send into the forensic laboratory. We can get it sped up with a little bit of extra pressure, especially if it was in the media, we can get him a bit, a bit, more, bit more pressure to get a result yeah. quicker. Yeah. But normal DNA is six weeks to two to three months. So when you work on the Oscar case... DNA gets becomes back quick. Yeah. <laughs> and that's unfortunate the realities of pressures of the media yeah. and, and, and other stuff yeah. compared. And unfortunately our victims are often unidentified from the poorest of society, black females, and don't unfortunately get the necessary attention that I think they should when these cases are investigated. But we digress. Let's yes. go back to yeah. the training component. Yeah. So so this forensics capacity to help identify them. Then as I said, making sure that our detectives are in a position to understand what they're dealing with, not make the same mistakes that, that people have made in the beginning phases, and know how properly to go about investigating these, setting up a task team. What what 
investigative inquiries do you have to follow up on, et cetera. And that's where the training course that we developed, which we changed and adapted from the original FBI course of three weeks that, to, to, to what we have. Uh, so the, a SAPS course, we can generally say this is a SAPS owned and SAPS developed course if you look at the current material in the training course. How, how did the restructuring of SAPS impact in, the, in, yeah. in, in this whole story? Uh, it was not good. And that I do definitely lay. And what was the restructuring? Yeah. So pre Jackie Celebi destroying SAPS to a large degree um, in 2006, when he closed down specialized units, typically what you had is the old days, they referred to them as murder and robbery units, which obviously had a very negative apartheid connotation that were revamped into what we call the serious and violent crime units. So you might find that in Pretoria, there's one serious and violent crime unit that would cover the 20 stations in Pretoria. And any high profile cases would go to the serious and violent crime unit. And they typically had your better detectives, your better resource detectives, just better experienced detectives were dealing with it. So, because these are detectives that are working on these crimes yeah. on a daily basis. Complex They're not being crimes. distracted by other crimes. Yeah. They're not getting a fraud case across exactly. their desk. Yeah. They're focused on serious violent serious crimes. Serious and violent crime. So they're usually the better ones that have been pulled into that unit. Um, so typically in the past, pre-2006, we just, and there were 27 SVC units throughout the whole country that covered the whole of the country. So it was a great network because if you had a training course, you had guys from the different units all over the all over the country. So if you ever needed help in Toyondo, mm -hmm. you phone Paul Romacardi from Toyondo SVC. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Great, thanks. Listen, can you follow up something for me up there? And you had a great. So network. how did that? So in two thousand and six, that stopped. Yeah. So we had in all SVC units, we had members that would they were the regular people coming on our courses. Yes. So we at least had one, if not more, at a SVC unit throughout the country. Mm. Um, and so they you had an ones. incredible network set up to identify. These are people that are trained to look at, okay, these are the cases, the dockets that are, or the cases that are coming into our, into our police stations. I've, I, I mind, I have now identified serial. a serial case here. And it would go to them automatically. Okay. No fast, no fanfare, no Fair. long paperwork. Okay. Bam, that was what would happen. Perfect. And that was perfect. Then, of course, Jackie Celebi in 2006, as we know with his corruption history that followed, shut down the serious and violent crime units, mm. shut down the sexual offenses units, shut down most all task teams that were operating at the time, whether it was a mm. temporary one like the quarry case at the time or otherwise, shut all those down. And Why? Well, well, why do you think? Uh, as we know, he, he was later subsequently convicted of corruption and, and associating sure. with criminals. And of course, yes. who were the ones catching the high profile criminals was the serious and violent crime units. But now that might look a little too obvious. So let's shut down a bunch of units. And we're going to, the argument was going to be, we're going to empower the individual police stations to deal with these type of cases themselves. Mm. But the reality was, I mean, the, the, the serious and violent crime detectives weren't Jedi. <laughs> you know, they were successful because they worked as a team of experienced detectives who had limited amount of cases and could focus on these. Now, what they did is they said, right, all you serious and violent crime detectives, you two, you're going to go to Mamalodi East Police Station. You, you're going to go to Pretoria Central. You're not going to get the same product out of a lone detective who's now carrying the stolen cell phone docket maybe or so and overwhelmed with lots of cases. He's not going to be able to deal with that same high-level complex murder as the, as the team of detectives on standby because we would have it where if the Oscar Pistorius had occurred, crime incident had occurred, when there's SVC units, you would have had that task, that um, standby unit um, um, group which would have been 20 detectives, would have been called out. One detective would have been responsible for the docket, but he would have had 19 other detectives to help him control the crime scene, mm. follow up on various inquiries, and he is sort of the, or she is the sole responsible person for that particular case. So shut them down because I think they were too successful in catching the people that he was buddies with. That's okay. my personal opinion. Well, Whether it's a fact, I don't know. Fine. Makes um, sense. I mean. and, and shut down. And, but with the proviso of empowering the stations, which people on the outside say, well, that makes sense. All of us on the inside were going, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You're not going to get the same outcome. And unfortunately, because you're creating happens. the issues they have in America, where you've got independent, you, yeah. you're trying to apply that kind of logic. And, and we know that that's not yeah. the best system to have in place to tackle. And, and a problem. lot of those very experienced detectives decide, you know what? I mean, you, you've gone from investigating high profile, complex, complicated cases to, in literally in some instances, some of them were victimized. Oh, you think you're special and fantastic because you were an SVC detective. Oh. You're not going to have a car. Here's a cell phone, stolen cell phone docket. And a lot of the guys left and went into private industry and are now yeah. snapped up by companies such as banks, et cetera, et cetera. Who and we mean, and you, you mean a lot of here. Lot. I'm talking probably, if not 50% more, in my personal opinion, yeah. was snapped up. By. So a tragic loss to our policing capability. Absolutely, without a doubt. How, where are we now? Okay. So what's happened post that? And so as a result of that, now we had cases being dealt with by a station. 
yeah. which has maybe one or two people dealing with all unnatural deaths. And that station detective, he's not allowed to go and investigate a crime that occurred next door in a different station's area. Because mm. his boss will say, sorry, but that's not, that's their worry. Mm. That those two cases, even if there's a DNA match, not our problem. Sure. So now what you had is the fragmentation and exactly what we said shouldn't happen in terms of serial investigations. We still had the training going on, okay. but it now became hit and miss. Some provinces that today they would put together a task team for this thing. Other ones they would say, no, we're not going to put together a task team. So it became a struggle every time we had a serial. There was no uniformity in how these things were being dealt with. Prov provinces differed. You know, and where were you in this in the system? How did you then fit in, plug into the so, supporting the this effort at individual police stations? So we were based obviously at Detective Head Office originally and later on in the Forensics Division. So we could still get activated. But the problem is we don't take over the case. We assist and advise that detective and bring our knowledge and resources where we can. But you still have to have a task team of people, not a big task, even five, six people whose sole job it is to deal with this and any related cases. Mm. And this that wasn't happening as effectively okay. um, for various reasons, like I mentioned a moment ago. Yeah. So the training was still there. And if we were lucky, someone would get pulled into the case or it landed in their area of jurisdiction. And they they could get involved based on their, 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 their... How frustrating a period was this for you? Massively. And to a large degree, some of those frustrations still exist because the serious and violent crimes units were never opened up again. Hmm. Um, you know, Hawks has got nothing to do with this. Um, organized crimes got nothing to do with this. Some provinces you might find it could be given to an organized crime unit. Um, other provinces, no. Um, other provinces, Hawks, maybe would get involved. Other ones would say, no, we just deal with economic crimes and corruption. It just became a nightmare trying so to So your get challenge these. is to find a way to get back, yeah. to claw back yeah. some of the efficiencies that you had. And how did you do that? And so what? give us a very kind of brief kind of pricey of what, what, what the situation now is yeah. then in its entirety. So, well, about, uh, we started to realize we needed to have a national policy on how serials are dealt with. Trying to get that from inside of SAPS up and running was proving literally impossible. So we would have our suggestions of this is how we think these cases should be handled, but there was nothing that said it will be done this way. Mm. So I then started to nag at a friend of mine who works at the Civilian Secretariat for Policing, which is sort of a civilian oversight body um, in, linked to the minister's office. And I said to this, this to, to Bilkis Omar, who worked, I said, we really need to get a serial policy. What you guys do is partly policy. Come on, let's, let's do this. And thankfully, she said, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. And they started to have meetings throughout the country with stakeholders from police to criminal, um, to prosecutions, to you name it, giving their various input on what do we think should be in a policy. And of course, guided massively by our unit, because mm -hmm. obviously the policy had to reflect the realities on the ground of what we want to avoid. So in other words, if one murder is in Gauteng province and the other one happens to be just in the border of Northwest, the policy must say what will happen, mm -hmm. not this one decides this today and tomorrow that one decides what. And eventually we hammered out a very nice policy, which deals with all the things that were frustrations and was eventually signed off by the minister, I think about a year and a half ago, which was still Fagile Mbulule, who, signed, who was the one who signed it off. Okay. How far they are in implementing that policy and how many people are aware of it, I am not sure at this point okay. in time. But that was I intended to take out the decision making in terms of how it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, that there's not discretion by this today, this station commissioner says this and tomorrow this provincial commissioner says that to streamline it in the in, in So there's the a ways. rule book that stations need to apply they have in these to kinds apply. of cases. Yeah. And and maybe we can, uh, you know, I think it would be interesting to find out more about the implementation. So maybe that's something mm. we can do some research on mm. and, and, and get a, give the audience a real clear understanding of, of how yeah. that implementation is practically being rolled out today and, and across police stations. The most important the thing is it's, it's said there had to be a task team and it had to be filled yes. with trained people who've done the course. Okay. That's the biggest, the biggest step in the right direction is, is that. And when they're yeah. dealing with these cases, they don't deal with anything else. Yeah. That's the most biggest thing would probably lead to the best success. Yeah. The other bits were just the practicalities of, of things we've realized are, are frustrating and difficult as the investigation goes on. It, uh, is corruption still an issue at, at, the, at, at the police? In general, yes, it's a yeah. massive, it's a massive problem. Yes. Corruption and inefficiency is sadly to say. Okay, uh, let me put it huge. this way, because I know we talk about, I mean, you know, taking bribes at roadblocks and et cetera, et cetera, the kind of very basic kind of level of corruption. But, you know, do you feel that there's potentially that, that management still want to not have an environment that is too efficient when it comes to policing certain crimes? Um, 
I kind of have always felt that the psychologically motivated crimes, you don't have the same kind of corruption sure, as sure. you would have like a guy arrested for drunk driving or fraud where, you know, money changing hands on various levels in the criminal justice system could potentially take place. I think usually most people are unanimous that these types of things are horrible, horrific. And do you want to be caught out as the guy who helped the serial murderer get away? No. Because yeah. for, 50, for 50 bucks? So so the the, the issue really here was that the investigator your unit kind of got bundled into the shutting down of all of these special units and that was really done to cover the tracks of specific crimes yeah. that that want to be that we yeah. want to we want to avoid having efficient policing yeah, yeah. applied to yeah. um so you were just the victim of yeah of a of a of, an, of a different Sadly corrupt so. intention essentially yeah. okay fair enough um in segment three i really want to talk about the psychologically motivated crimes course in a bit of detail because i mean this is a was a is a pretty unique um um, um thing that happens in south africa mm -hmm. you were very central to that um and i think it's gonna uh, it's gonna be interesting to understand what would happen over the course of that of, of that course so we'll talk about that um don't forget to uh, tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.ca.za or search profiler africa on youtube and please subscribe to our page we're also available on itunes and you can also follow us on instagram twitter or facebook simply search for profile africa and please do go on to our social media pages and if you have any specific topics that you'd like us to cover or any questions for gerard then please do um post them there on our social media pages we'll be back Welcome back. So far in this episode, we have spoken about serial murder in general. We've spoken about the typical MO, the typical victim type, the typical suspect type, looking at historically and then how kind of trends have evolved over the years. We've talked about how basic training happens and we've spoken about some of the hindrances that have uh, occurred as a result of um, units being closed down and changes within the South African Police Service. I want to give the listener a real understanding of just how evolved our knowledge of serial uh, crime fighting is. And so there's a three week course that you would take each year. Tell us about this course mm -hmm. and tell us about how it started. Tell us about what happened on the course and um, what the benefits were of, of, of having such a such an intense mm -hmm. training um, capability. Yeah. So the course that we currently have called the Psychologically Motivated Crimes course well, it had its origins in the training that Robert Ressler, who was an ex-FBI profiler, came out to give us in the mid-1990s after he was assisting with um, some of the murder series we were having at the time, such as Moses Satole. Of course, but that was a very American-based course with American conclusions and understanding of serial mm -hmm. murder, which you've now, if you've been listening to the podcast, will realize it's a bit different here in South Africa. Yes. So when I joined in 2001, I did quite a lot of revamping. Uh, Mickey Pistorius also contributed a lot, of course, to the development of the, the, the sort of South Africanizing of it. And when I took over in 2001, I kind of did a major overhaul of the curriculum kind of again taking it even closer to being pretty much just a south african based course relevant to south africa and our circumstances um and that's kind of what we've been presenting on an annual basis pretty much once a year to anything from 25 to 35 detectives mainly detectives as i said um from various units who have any who potentially could have any time in their careers get involved in these but we also started to include some crime scene people from the provincial and the national crime scene units who might get involved um one or two people from forensics from the victim identification center um, but primarily the focus was on detectives who, who will be faced with dealing with these kinds of crimes so we have a selection process so most police courses your commander just says, tells you there you go you're going on a course next week for five weeks whatever but we had a selection process to see why does this person want to come on the course what is the motivation what do they understand about serial to see if there's a little bit of additional insight because it's a difficult course you write tests every day at the end of the week you write tests on the week's work there's practical assignments so academically it's not a holiday mm. Uh, which some police courses can sometimes be more of a drinking holiday than actual work. So it's a hard course. And I think that process meant we did get good people. And often people we would encounter through investigations, we thought this would be the right kind of person. Because, you you know, to be able to investigate psychologically motivated crimes, it's not everybody's cup of tea. You get mm -hmm. people who are great at fraud, great at 
you know, extortion, greater this, but these are a different kind of case. And you want to make sure you get the right person. So we would select them. They would come on the course for three weeks. Uh, we usually presented at either at Hummond's Crawl, at the Detective Academy, or wherever it was based at the time. And essentially, for three weeks, they, we start off with dealing with the basics of, you know, what is what is psychologically motivated crime? What is stalking? What is pedophilia? What is serial rape? We then go into murder, sexual murder, then serial murder, muti murder, um, and focus very much on how to identify these kind of crimes, but then more importantly, how to investigate these kind of crimes. So we have practical crimes in exercises. They they have a visit to, uh, uh, they take a, uh, a one day a week when they were in the course of the three weeks, they would go to Best Corpus Hospital and we'd arrange that they would be able to interview forensic patients who've committed some of these Kind of crimes who happen to be back at best copies although the majority of these people don't end up in best copies but they get training in this sort of identifying or rec- recognizing mental health issues diagnoses so that if they have a case where a suspect is behaving a certain way they realize oh i better get a psychologist to come and just consult or we should refer this person for observation um, we do a practical crimes and exercise which is a, at the end towards the end of the course which is the application of all their knowledge with a whole bunch of different crime scenes they have to put it all together ask the right questions otherwise they don't get all the information call out the right resources otherwise they don't get the the additional information and at the end of the day put together their own little profile although we're not trying to train them to be profilers but to, just to see if they're kind of thinking about these cases in the way we want them to put together a little profile write a motivation to their superior why this is a serial and why we need what we need to do so again applying that side of it and they get uh, assessed on those in addition to the tests mm. they go on the shooting range i think this year they also visited uh, the forensic pathologists for to attend some autopsy some mortuary uh, autopsies we then have other specialists who give lectures on forensic entomology which is the use of insects um, as I said, we've got the forensic pathologists who contribute to the course, forensic anthropologists who explain what role they can play in these. We have people who give them a bit of input on cell phone, you know, forensics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all the resources we think that they would need mm. to be in- to investigate anything from stalking to a pedophile to a serial rapist to, um, you know, a serial murderer. And often some, what you might find is that the serial murderer has elements of all of those in their crime. So yeah. it's all a build up into that sort of second week, which is predominantly just serial murder, third week we would get very practical and, and integrated all together. I mean, because we want to look at a profile, not as a document that is created that l- says that lists a series of characteristics. It is a practical set of skills that you apply on a daily basis. Mm. That is profiling. It's, an, the out, heart it's it. an outlook. It's a skills knowledge yeah. set base that you're going to apply to just very unique crimes. You were talking about you would select the, the applicants for, for the course. Give us one or two of the criteria that would be typical in somebody that you think is going to be uh, successful in this field. I think what we, one of the key things we would look for in the application would be, is this person have an inquiring mind? Because often people say, I always wanted to understand why Cyril does this. I always wanted to understand in my crime scenes when I saw this, why does it happen? And that's what we're looking for. The person who wants to see beyond the cigarette butt on the crime scene has just been DNA evidence and rather as a sign of the suspect came back after the crime maybe mm. because the cigarette is clearly not been there since last night when it was raining. Yeah. You know, it's dry or something like that. To kind of look beyond the so – to someone who wants to interpret and understand – how we got to this point and that's key because that's what we need you to do when you start to look at your crime scene is not just see forensic evidence but to see psychological evidence and if you have that naturally inquiring aspect to your application you know definitely that's the type of person we want to look for yeah often people would say oh i've read lots of books about it which again shows additional interest because it became a quite a popular course for people who want to come on and and it gets sort of very good reviews at the Mm. end of each course we've had people from scotland yard come in on the course uh different parts of the world come in on on the course so we're very proud of the course so it became something that people wanted on their cv and of course you often then get people there for the wrong reason so does it show that that person has that that additional like even if they say i you know I've, i watch every episode of mindhunter mm. uh, because it's fascinating or i've mm. read this book or that book or you know etc etc or i once got involved in one of these cases you know things that show it's not just someone who saw this land on the table and go that sounds interesting i'm gonna apply yeah, for that yeah, yeah, yeah. famously in america i know that ted bundy was um approached by detectives i'm not sure which case in relation to but he did offer some aid and kind of giving insights into how you would how you would go about building a profile on a serial killer like Mm -hmm. himself in in south africa do we involve have we involved our killers in the in the 
you know, the criminals themselves in mm. the training? No. Um, look, Ted Bundy, yeah, I think it was a Riverman case. Which I think was it? Okay. Robert, somebody published a book about it. Somebody and I, Ted Bundy and I, solved okay. the river. So, no, what we have done, obviously, is whenever we arrest these guys, we do an interview as thorough as possible to try and find out not just information about the case, but about them and their pers- personalities and their backgrounds. Um, as if some of my masters and doctor research was interviewing these guys. Um, but we've never gone and said, look, we've got a case. This guy did this. What do you think? Okay. Um, we'd rather gather information through the process of our our, our work yeah. and kind of have it with us. But not, no, not not in that sense. I don't know if we might get criticized for that. I don't know. But no, not. not who not who drives the course now? What is the status of the course now? Yeah. So it's basically it's set down usually for once a year at least. We've mm-hmm. had years when we'd maybe had two in a year for various reasons. Okay. Um, and it's basically all pretty much run and, and taken care of by uh, Colonel Elmarie Myberg, who's, who's the longest serving member in the unit right now. Um, so she kind of oversees it, obviously with the input of the other members who give guess, give lectures themselves and help on the, on present the, uh, some of the so material. So where do we fit in the kind of global academia around serial crime? Well, if you look at it this way, we're we're the only law enforcement agency that has a standard course on serial murder investigation or psychological murder crimes. Um, It's not a part of any other standard curriculum in any other law enforcement. I mean, people might invite an FBI person to come and give a lecture for a day or two, Mm. but we have this as part of our annual curriculum for uh, not all detectives, but select amount of detectives. So we're the only country that's doing that. So that's good. And I think, and has proven its value over the years. Um, in terms of research, again, I mentioned the earlier research project that was done with John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and that's, I think, probably the, the largest serial murder study done to date with okay. actual police case files. So in that sense, that research is really amazing. It's mm. been published in a special edition of the Journal of Investigative Psychology and Defender Profile in, in 2015. Um, we've got this course, which we run and build upon every year with our experience and new case studies. So in that sense, we're, we're really quite well set up in mm. terms of um, our understanding of serial murder and of, of, of equipping our police to deal with it. So I think the takeout that I want to, uh, from this episode really as well, one of the takeouts is that we as a society should become very protective. I think we A, need to understand more of the impact of of things like in 2006 when Jackie Salibi uh, shut down all of these units. We need to understand the impact that that's had on our policing mm-hmm. better. And we need to start as a society to become really protective of the, in- well, aware of and protective of the intelligence that we we have mm. the intelligence like yours, which we've lost in the South African police service, and we need to stop this from happening. Mm. Mm. You know, and I think, that, and I think that's something that, um, yeah, we really need to be cognizant of as a society is that we don't want to lose mm. all of this intelligence. You know, the brain drain is something which is real in a in a lot of in a lot of South African society, but when it comes to policing, I think it's something we really, really need mm. to be protective. No, of. you don't want to lose institutional knowledge. You can appoint a hundred people tomorrow, yeah. but if they have no knowledge; they're pointless. It's Absolutely. not going to help. Jared, Thank you once again for a very engaging conversation. We'll be back again next week. Next week, we're going to look, take a real deep dive into a single serial murder case. We'll look at crime scene photographs. We'll discuss the killer's psychological profile in detail. So please do uh, join us again for episode four. We are privileged to have Jared Labaskachny, one of the world's leading intelligences when it comes to serial crime, um, with us every week so that we can unpack these things in great detail. So please join us for episode four. Thank you very much for listening uh, you can uh, tell your friends to catch us on brandlive.co.za or search profiler africa on youtube and please subscribe to our page we're also available on itunes and you can also follow us on instagram twitter or facebook simply search for profiler africa thank you gerard thanks very much paul thanks for listening and pleasant dreams <laughs>